There is a crisis in forensic science. The most trusted crime-fighting tools responsible for hundreds of thousands of convictions may not be as bulletproof as once thought. There's a laundry list of forensic techniques that are now scrutinized. Fingerprints may not be as unique as we thought. Nobody's ever questioned fingerprints before. And decades-old techniques like blood spatter analysis and bite mark comparisons are being exposed as more art than science. Killers are walking free, and innocent people are going to prison. I don't belong here. I'm innocent. Can new technologies help put the science back in forensic science? Now, researchers and crime scene investigators venture into the not-so-distant future where avatar detectives enter murder scenes to witness the moment of death. We can see the body on the floor. Forensic engineers make identifications from fingerprints of glass. And coroners conduct virtual autopsies, peeling back layers of 3D victims, exposing once undetectable evidence of murder. Now, Nova puts forensics under the microscope to see how good science can go bad and how to make getting away with murder a thing of the past. Right now on NOVA, Forensics on Trial. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the following. The David H. Koch Fund for Science, supporting NOVA and promoting public understanding of science. Discovering new knowledge. HHMI. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by PBS viewers like you. Thank you. March 11th, 2004, 7.30 a.m., rush hour. Ten bombs ripped through Madrid's crowded commuter trains. 191 people are killed, more than 1,800 wounded. It is the worst terror attack in Spain's history and bears the hallmarks of Al-Qaeda. The scale of these attacks has horrified Spain. Soft targets chosen, no warnings given. The international manhunt that follows triggers a crisis in forensic science that will shake it to its very foundation. Knew about the shoddy work of the FBI special agent? Forensic techniques trusted by police for over 100 years are shown to be dangerously flawed served 18 years in prison for a murder he did not commit. Killers are walking free, while innocent people are sent to prison, and even death row. This was a gross perversion of justice. The investigation to find the Madrid bomber sends shockwaves through the forensic community. And it all starts here. In a commuter parking lot, 10 stations away from where the bomb went off. Spanish police find a van. Inside is a blue plastic bag containing bomb-making materials. It could be a huge break. It's possible fingerprints have been left behind on the bag itself. The idea that every person's fingerprint is unique has been a foundation of forensic investigation for over a hundred years. But this case poses a potential challenge. The lines and ridges that form the distinctive patterns of fingerprints left on evidence are created from sweat and oil. A print left on plastic, like the bag recovered in Madrid, can be easily wiped off or distorted. Mark Acree, is a former FBI fingerprint analyst. 
Plastic bags, by their very nature, are non-porous. The fingerprint is sitting on that surface, and it's very vulnerable to being smeared or smudged. But there are established ways to recover prints from non-porous surfaces. Evidence ranging from gun handles to keys to plastic bags are placed in an airtight chamber. Inside, a chemical called cyanoacrylate, more commonly known as superglue, is heated up. Its vapors coat the sweat and oil of the print with a sticky white residue, making the print visible. But it does have limitations. Superglue chemically alters the lines of sweat and oil and can even obscure details of a print's unique pattern. Using this method, Spanish investigators recover a partial print on the bag. They rush digital photos to forensic labs across the globe, including the FBI. Examiners first need to determine if there are enough lines and details in the ridges for a clear comparison. Ridge details are broken down into distinctive shapes, like dots that look like islands, endings where ridge lines terminate, and intersecting lines called bifurcations. From the Madrid bomber's print, the FBI is able to zero in on seven unique traits for comparison. Now, they look for a match. They take the image, they encode it, and then it's launched against this database. From over 47 million criminals, federal employees, military personnel, and people of national security interest, the FBI supercomputer identifies 20 prints that contain some of the same distinctive traits as the Madrid print. Examiners require that 12 unique traits correspond to declare a match. The FBI identifies one of the 20 prints that actually shares 15 traits in common with the one found in Madrid. It comes from the left index finger of this man, a 37-year-old former US Army lieutenant and a convert to Islam, Brandon Mayfield. As a lawyer now living in Portland, Oregon, Mayfield recently represented a convicted terrorist. The FBI sneaks into his home while he's at work, taps his phones, collects samples for DNA, and watches his wife and children. On May 6, 2004, just two months after the bombing, the FBI moves in. They pushed their way into uh, my office. They took my hands behind my back and they handcuffed me. I didn't know what they were searching and arresting me for. They never told me. This fingerprint match sparks the arrest of American Brandon Mayfield as the bomber responsible for the murder of nearly 200 people. Spain's 9-11. A fingerprint top counterterrorism officials now tell Newsweek magazine is a, quote, absolutely incontrovertible match to Portland attorney Brandon Mayfield. Mayfield insists on his innocence. He hires his own fingerprint analyst to testify at a pretrial hearing. The expert's testimony is not what Mayfield expects. He said, it's a match. That's when I knew the train to a death penalty had just pulled out of the station. Federal agents take Mayfield back to jail to await trial. Hours later, half a world away, Spanish investigators make a stunning discovery that changes Brandon Mayfield's life. I was told that the Spanish police had found that this fingerprint belonged to an Algerian that it wasn't me. <laughs> Spanish
Spanish police determine that the fingerprint belongs to this man, Juanani Daoud, a known terrorist. News from Spain. A fingerprint found on a bag linked to the Madrid train attacks belongs to an Algerian national, not Brandon Mayfield. Mayfield is released from jail after 15 days. Now, the question on everyone's mind is, how could this misidentification happen? It's a question that will eventually make its way to the United States Congress. The similarity between Mayfield's print and the bombers is undeniable. It challenges a century-old pillar of forensic science, that no two prints are identical. We always assume that fingerprints are very, very unique. But what the Mayfield case demonstrates is that parts of a fingerprint can be so similar, it's possible for two people to be identified to one latent print. The US Congress calls on the National Academy of Sciences, the nation's most prestigious research institution, to conduct an investigation into all forensic technologies and techniques. In July 2009, they released their report. In short, they find there's not enough science in forensic science. The big news was that forensic science was fractured. Jessica Gable is a professor of law and frequently lectures on the NAS findings. It lacks the rigors, the standards, the quality controls and procedures that we find usually in science. And in that light, forensic science actually can sometimes contribute to wrongful convictions. The Madrid bomber case is a perfect storm of forensic flaws. Only a partial print is recovered on a plastic surface, and that is eventually distorted. There is also a surprising similarity between parts of Mayfield's print and the real bombers. Together, these could have led to the conviction of an innocent man. Can modern science prevent this from happening again? The answer is deceptively simple. Examiners need a way to expose more of fingerprints' unique details. I was talking to Dr. Shaler. Akhlesh Laktakia and his team at Penn State University's Materials Research Institute are eyeing a new technology that promises to do just that. His project got wings from a fly. A fly's ability to elude capture fascinated Laktakia since he was a boy. Before you can approach the fly, the fly has seen you somehow or the other and has flown off. Laktakia wonders if the structure of the fly's eye gives it a unique ability to see predators approaching from all angles. To find out, he turns to an ultra-thin material called CTF, columnar thin film to make an impression of the minutest contours of the fly's cornea. Each square inch of the film contains billions of glass bristles. It forms a layer 200 times thinner than a sheet of paper. When it coats the fly's eye, the bristles conform to every peak and valley. The result is that microscopic nooks and crannies show up in stunning three-dimensional detail. The technology isn't helping Laktakia catch flies, but it does give him an idea for how to catch criminals. Could this technology be used to get the same incredible detail from a fingerprint? This film would reproduce the topographic features, the geography, if you will, of the ridges in the fingerprint. If CTF can capture a fingerprint, it could revolutionize forensics. But will it work? The team places a fingerprint on a glass slide. The slide is loaded into a chamber called a thermal evaporator. Inside the evaporator, the fingerprint is sprayed with a microscopically thin layer of vaporized glass. 
Unlike superglue, the glass does not chemically alter the oils that form the print. After about 30 minutes, the glass bristles harden into an ultra-thin film that preserves minute details. Even with the naked eye, the CTF print reveals ridges that would be missing in a superglue print. With the new technique, the ridges are far more prominent. So you can see creases like this is a crease, this is a crease, this is another crease. Under a microscope, there are exponentially more ridge lines. With this technique, examiners in the Madrid bombing case could have had more points for comparison and a better chance to match the fingerprint to the real bomber. The CTF fingerprint technique is currently being reviewed for use in the field. But fingerprint analysis is not alone on the list of forensic disciplines currently under the microscope. There's a laundry list of forensic techniques that are now scrutinized based on the NAS report, bite mark evidence, footwear impressions. There's no real science behind it as much as it's just trying to match patterns. And if that matching process goes bad, people's lives are changed forever. May 23rd, 1991, 2.10 a.m. In a rural community outside Syracuse, New York, police and firefighters rush to a blaze at a farmhouse. Flames shooting up the front of the house. Beautiful, big, two-story farmhouse. The occupant of the home, 49-year-old Sabina Kulikowski, is missing. I took one deputy, and we went up this laneway, worked our way up to about here. She was nude, just about totally covered with blood. She'd been stabbed numerous times. A distinctive bruise catches his eye. We notice a bite mark on the side of the body. But it gets worse. At the autopsy, Ecker sees bite marks on her breast, belly, and back. We discovered that there was at least four more sets of bite marks. These marks could be the key to identifying Sabina's killer. Dr. Lowell Levine is a leading expert on forensic dentistry. The teeth cause a pattern injury in skin. The a person will actually close their teeth down on some tissue. So a bite mark is really a bruise. And it's basically a bruise with patterning. Bite mark forensics is based on the idea that everyone's teeth create distinctive patterns. To find a match, forensic dentists or odontologists make a wax impression of a suspect's teeth. Then they try to match the pattern made by the size, shape, and spacing of the teeth on the wax impression to a photo of the bruise on the skin of the victim. What we're basically doing is looking for similar characteristics in similar locations. In the murder of Sabina Kulikowski, it doesn't take long to find a suspect to compare for a match. Investigators learn that six days before the murder, a hard-drinking 31-year-old is released from prison. His name is Roy Brown. After a Cayuga County, New York social service agency takes away his daughter, he threatens a massacre. What was said was, what do you want? Do you want me to come down there and open up on you all with a Uzi? Sabina Kulikowski worked at the Cayuga County Social Service Agency. Police interviews with Brown's ex-wives reveal a bombshell. When he gets mad, he bites. 
Brown denies involvement in the killing. I gave him all kinds of samples to test to show it's not me. I gave him all kinds of hair samples, saliva samples, blood samples, you name it. He allows authorities to take a wax impression of his teeth. It reveals a distinctive pattern. Brown is missing two teeth. This leaves wide gaps in the wax impression. The bruise on the victim should have the same gaps that correspond to Brown's missing teeth. But it only has a gap on the right side. It appears Brown's teeth don't match the evidence.